Thank you very much, John, for playing for us this morning. Appreciate that. Good morning, everybody. Oh, let's try that again. Good morning, everybody. There we go. Good morning and welcome to Christ Church. We are certainly glad you are here uh, to worship with us today, those of you that are here online and those of you who are joining us here in the Centrum. We're going to begin our service by singing a couple songs. The first one is in worship and song, the one with the green cover there next to your seat. This is entitled, Your Grace is Enough. And if you're still sleepy, this one will wake you up. So let's stand and sing together, Your Grace is Enough. One, two, three, and... song is in the other song book, The Faith We Sing. It's number 2223. They'll know we are Christians by our love. One, two, and...
turn to those who are around you this morning and welcome them to worship. Well, it's real good to see everybody this morning. I'm Pastor Jay, lead pastor. We're glad you're with us. I know David's greeted you already, but those of you online, we do encourage you, if you are joining us online, to go to our website at ccumwv.org, and there you can download a copy of our our bulletin and see the, the lyrics to the songs we're singing and the things we're doing in worship today, and we're really glad that you're with us. Uh, as we move through some of our announcements today, I did want to lift up a couple of things. The, the Fife Street uh, study on Monday night is back on. We will be gathering down uh, at Fife Street on Monday night at 5.30 to begin a, looking at a study on the book of Acts. We invite you to join us if you'd like to do so. Grab a snack and uh, spend some time in fellowship and studying. Also, one of the things that's coming upon us is our graduate recognition day. I noticed there was graduations from colleges yesterday. It seems it always comes earlier and earlier and earlier in our life. But if you know of a graduate that's connected with our community, please let us know uh, so we can honor them and recognize them, both high school graduates and college graduates. All you need to do is contact the church office with their name and contact information. Also, we're continuing to move forward with our our electronic church directory. You know, a lot of folks have gotten their picture made. I haven't yet. I'm going to try to do that today. That's why I wore my bow tie so I could have a nice nice picture, but we hope to be a part of that. Also, you'll notice several other things happening. The women are having a book sale. They're collecting books. Uh, Our yarnettes are collecting unused yarn. Our uh, pickleball crew is signing up and playing pickleball on Sunday afternoons. But one of our uh, major ministries, particularly in the life of the church during the summer, is our uh, cross-ministry program that we do in conjunction with the Rebuilding Together Agency. We've been working with them for a number of years. And Kathy Cheney would like to come up and share with us about the cross-ministry. So I invite Kathy to come up, and Kathy, I invite you to use this mic over here so you'll be clear on the, uh, getting a little feedback. But. Good morning. So the cross ministry turns eight this year, and we have a lot to celebrate. After a frustrating two and a half years due to COVID of being shut down, we are returning to normal this summer. We have 11 groups coming in 2023 so far. Two groups have already been here, and nine more are scheduled. I had some more groups that had contacted me, but due to scheduling problems, we had to cancel them. So, so far we have a full schedule. We have had a high school group from Indianapolis come and spend their spring break with us. And then they are coming back in June for their summer trip. They just can't get enough of us. And then we had an adult group that was here recently from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, who, uh, were with us last fall, and they are coming back again next October. Um, Just like a bad penny, they just keep showing up. Our remaining groups this summer will be from Ohio, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Illinois, and Indiana. Well, how do they hear about us, you might ask? Well, it's all part of that United Methodist connectionalism. Our church's ministry, the Cross Ministry is on the Board of Global Ministries webpage uh, for volunteer and mission opportunities. And churches go there to find places where they can go and they see us. Uh, we will be using the Virginia Street property for the majority of the groups that are coming. They stay there and then they come over here and use Fellowship Hall for dinner and for prep of meals. Um, and they love the apartment over at Virginia Street. Uh, In return for our hospitality, the groups manage to minister to homeowners who are desperately in need of home repairs and upgrades in order to be able to stay in their homes safely. Our homeowners, or the majority of them, come to us through Rebuilding Together, which is a nonprofit national organization with an affiliate based here in Charleston. And they supply these repairs to homeowners at no cost to the homeowners. 
Now, the operation of Cross Ministry takes more than one person to run. Home visits, material ordering, material transport, project management, daily wrap-up sessions, meal preps, and devotions are all part of a typical week when a group is here. It literally takes a village to make this all happen. Maybe you have a pickup truck and could deliver some supplies. Maybe you don't know which end of a hammer to hold, but you would love to greet people and make them feel welcome. Maybe you cook a mean lasagna. Maybe you love to chat with people and you could sit with the homeowners and talk with them. Maybe you would like nothing better than to be able to boss people around on a job site. Or maybe you have a fun devotion you would like to share in an evening with the group. This year, my life is complicated by the fact that in the month of June and July, my son, Evan, who is stationed in Germany, will be stateside, and he's dragging his wife and kids with him. While he is away in Texas taking classes, Amanda and the kids will be staying with Malcolm and I. They will be with us for six weeks. Six weeks. This is complicating my summer because my cross-ministry schedule with these groups coming was set in place before the Army decided what they were doing with Evan this summer. So, I could really, really use help. I could really use you to go the extra mile during the last three weeks of June or the last two weeks of July when I'm going to need help to make all of this happen. I would be deeply grateful if you were able to help in any of the capacities of which I've just mentioned. And big jobs can be much easier when broken up into small pieces. So if there's anything that you would like to help with, please see me after church and I will give you a big kiss. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And I want to thank you again, Kathy, for all the work you've done with Cross Ministries. When I first came to Christ Church back in 2015, Kathy came and said, we want to do this Cross Ministry thing. And I, I, was, I didn't know what I was doing. I said, yes. And we ran with it. And it's been just a wonderful ministry. And so I know you've got a busy summer, but I want to take just one moment to thank you, Kathy, for all you've done in bringing in those teams and all the, the work that's gone into that program. It's, it's a powerful program. Uh, touching lives both here locally and the lives of those who come and serve. And so we, we really thank you for that. As we gather for our time of prayer, I wanted to share a couple of the prayer concerns uh, that came to us uh, from our assistance ministry. As we've mentioned, we offer assistance to folks for utilities. But as they gather, surely in that ministry, talk to the individuals, and if they so desire, we invite them to share their prayer concerns with us. One said that they would ask that they would pray to be reunited uh, with their family uh, and take away the anger and the hurt uh, and the desire that's for harming one another that's been there. Another one asked uh, for a new beginning as they begin their new journey and some financial blessings as they move. Another one asked for prayers. They'd been in and out of the hospital. Uh, one asked for prayers because of a broken jaw and gout. Again, the folks that come to us bring with them burdens not just relative to their financial situation, but other things in their lives. So we want to pray for them. also invite you to pray for those members of our community that need a special touch of grace today. And actually one of our custodians going in for a procedure this week. And we remember Jeff as he uh, goes in for that procedure. Are there others that you may want to lift up from the floor? Uh, those of you that are online, of course, can share your prayer concerns through the chat feature. Uh, but are there others? Yes, Carolyn. Family of Rabbi Kirshner, right? A guy whose writings have touched so many lives uh, throughout our world. Uh, are there others? Okay. Well, as I light our prayer candle, let us center ourselves wherever we are here in the centrum, wherever you are online, and let us go to the Lord in prayer.
loving, shepherding God. As we gather as your people here in the centrum and across the airwaves, we, we come as your sheep, those who need your guidance, those who need your care. We come, Lord, bringing with us all that we are, those things that are positive, those things that are negative, our burdens, our concerns, all of our needs, Lord, we bring to your table. For you have promised that you would be with us in all things, and as we think of you as our shepherd, we know that you care for us. You will make sure we have what we need, not always what we want, perhaps, but what we need. And for that provision, Lord, we give you our thanks. We pray that you'd be with our neighbors who are going through the the difficult valleys of life, those who are wrestling with illness, those who are struggling with the illnesses of loved ones, yea, even those who walk through the valley of the shadow of loss. We, We pray that you would be with them, that indeed your rod and your staff would comfort them and you would help carry them through that valley so that they can again return to the other side the side of grace and love. Oh God, just pour your spirit upon them. We pray for your world and that you'd be with us as we seek to be your people, a people not embroiled in conflict, but a people living in harmony and grace where all sisters and brothers can sit down beside you and beside those still waters and celebrate the banquet of grace that you provide. Oh God, help us to do that. Guide our leaders, guide all those who are seeking to to lead your people to be good shepherds, to set aside their personal needs and to, to serve you and serve your people. We pray that especially for our political leaders because so often it get wrapped up in other issues, but may they ever keep in mind your call upon their lives to be shepherds, those who care for your people, providing for them. And we pray, O God, that you would be with us, your sheep, ever guiding, directing, and helping us in all that we do as we seek to be your disciples, those who follow the lead of the good shepherd, your son, Jesus, our Savior, who always invites us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'd like to invite our young disciples to come up. I see a few folks over there and a couple over here. Won't you all come up with me? All right. I think I'll sit here today. I want you all to sit up here. I want everybody to be able to see your faces, of course. So why don't you all sit up there, and I'll sit over here to the side, okay? You all coming? Come on down. Okay, I, don't know, I may have to move down so you can see me. All right, okay. Now, Ephraim, if I can't get up, it's on you, buddy. You're going to have to pull me up. All right. Well, you know, I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm going to quote some phrases, And I want you to to let me know who said that phrase. But since we've been talking about sheep and shepherd today, if you're going to answer, I want you to say, bah, like a sheep, okay? If you know the answer, say, bah, real loud, and then we'll see what the answer is, okay? So the first one I want to go is a phrase that you may have heard before, to infinity and beyond. Who said that? Bah? Who was it? Buzz Buzz Lightyear. Yep, there's Buzz, okay? All right, let's try this other one. Um... Some people are worth melting for. Yes, you didn't say bah. All right, there we go. Frosty, ah, close, it's Olaf. It was a snowman, though. You, had, you were there, you were there. Okay, uh, wh- what about uh, just keep swimming? Bah. Bah? Dory. Dory, yep, it's Dory. Okay, this is my favorite. Y'all ready? Be one cookie. Yeah, Cookie Monster. Yeah, all right. You know, so how did you know who said those things? How did you know who said that? Probably most of you have seen the movie, right? 
for the movie characters, or you'd watch Sesame Street, and that's how you knew about Cookie Monster, right? Okay. Well, I'm going to try one that's uh, maybe a little bit harder. Who said, love your neighbor as yourself? Ba? Ba? Yes, Jesus. Yeah, good job. You know, one of the things they tell us is that Jesus was like a shepherd. And shepherds, when they would say things, the sheep recognize their voice. They recognize their phrase. They know who their shepherd is. And so I think it's important for us as we go through life and we see things that are going on and things that are happening around us to think about, was that Jesus? You know, is Jesus doing something in the midst of that? And trying to recognize his voice when we're playing with our friends and doing other things. So I invite you to try to remember that. I know it's a little bit harder than just watching a movie and saying, you know, to infinity and beyond. But when we hear things that remind us of Jesus, to think about him. When you see a friend that's helping them, another friend out. When somebody falls on the playground and you go over to help them, you're kind of being like Jesus. And try to remember that, okay? Will you pray with me? All right, let's pray. Loving God, we thank you that you are like a shepherd, ever caring for us, calling our names, and seeking the best for us in all things. Amen. Amen. Now, you'll still like, we'll have to go back to doing it like John did. You all liked that, didn't you? All right, we'll see. Ah. And now as we prepare to share in our offerings, we invite you to remember that your offerings go to, excuse me, support the various ministries of our church, uh, things here locally, meeting the needs of our children and others. Also, some of your offerings go beyond our local church to, to needs beyond us into the world throughout the ministries of, of the United Methodist Church. And so as we share your offerings, we invite you to share generously and seek to meet the needs of people wherever they are. I want to catch my breath for a minute. Uh, we've chosen a somewhat different anthem today. Uh, hope we pull it off okay. I think we will. Uh, cut last week's last Wednesday, there was a band in town up at the Clay Center. It was a lot of fun. They were called Old Crow Medicine Show. They got a lot of songs. Not a lot of them I can do in church. But there's one I think that will speak to us today as we think about the loads we carry. Get off. I'd expect a man not to get lost. 
Every year I just keep you better, deeper in debt. There's a happy day, Lord, I haven't seen it yet. So take them away, take them away, Lord. Take away these chains from me. My heart is broken because my spirit's not free. Lord, take away these chains from me. The land that I love is the land that I'm working but it's hard to love it all the time when your back is a hurt. Get too old now to push this here plow. Please let me lay down so I can look up at the clouds. So take them away, take them away, Lord. Take away these chains from me. My heart is broken because my spirit's not free. Lord, take away these chains from me. rivers collide, the Brazos, the Navaso, and the big blue sky, floodplains, freight trains, watermelon vines, and any place on God's green earth, this is where I choose to die, so take them away, take them away, Lord, take away these chains from me, my heart is broken cause my spirit's not free, Lord, take away these chains. Take them away, take them away, Lord. Take away these chains from me. My heart is broken because my spirit's not free. Lord, take away these chains from me. gospel lesson, the, the band's going to do Reader's Theater for us. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths. For, for the, the sake, sake of, of his, his good, good name. name. Even when I walk through the dark valley. I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table before me right in front of my enemies. You, you bathe, bathe my, my head in oil. oil. My, my cup spills, spills over. over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, as we gather in your house and across the world through the gift of the internet, I pray as always that these words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight for you ever and always are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Those are perhaps some of the most famous lines of scripture ever written. They're, they're words we've heard time and time again in services of, of remembrance of our loved ones. They're words we may have memorized in Sunday school and have spoken quietly to ourselves when we're going through difficult times of fear and difficulty. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I know that's how most of us learn that verse. But I don't know if that's exactly what the Hebrew means. Now again, it's not any fault of the Hebrew, which is clear enough, but, but we run into struggles sometimes with translation. 
And I think part of our struggle with this one is the Elizabethan English of King James, the way they translated it. And that's the way I love hearing it. I'm probably you too. I, I love the old English language. And they did a good job of interpreting for their time. But, but the problem is, I think, that that word want has shifted. The meaning of the word want has kind of shifted over the centuries. I mean, if I stopped a person on the street today, and we may want to try that sometime, and ask them, what is the meaning of the word want? And you'd probably hear them say something about uh, a desire or a craving. I want a chocolate bar, the, the silky smooth imported kind, the kind that melts in your mouth. Or perhaps they say, I want a, a bigger house, a, a more luxurious car, a more fulfilling job, family members who understand me. Or maybe they'd say, I want my picture on, the, on People magazine. Or if they play music, I want to be on the cover of Rolling Stone. Or perhaps they say, oh, I want to be the time person of the year. But is that what the psalmist means when he says I shall not want I believe what the psalmist is saying would be better expressed as this modern translation we heard a moment ago with there is therefore I lack nothing or as another version puts it the Lord is my shepherd I have everything I need in the Lord we have everything we need you know, as I research this psalm, it's one that we hear so often, and I think sometimes we forget about its original intent, but, but it was a song the pilgrims would sing as they made their way to the temple in Jerusalem. And as they would go there, they would be celebrating the fact that they were going to God's house. For you see, for them, God was a homemaker. And I think sometimes when you listen to that psalm and if you allow that image of a, a house to play upon your imagination, you can hear, hear the bustle in the kitchen and the, the rattling of the pots and pans and you can see God scurrying around the table and putting out goblets and plates and wiping away the sweat uh, from the people who've traveled. You can almost smell the bread baking in the oven. This image of God fixing a banquet for God's people setting aside a beautiful picnic beside the quiet stream is a, is a powerful image. I've sometimes wondered, why does this song, above all the others, touch me in such a way and, and bring me such comfort? And again, I think part of it, again, is that lyrical beauty of the, the King James language that falls across our ears like a soft melody with all the makeths and the leadeths and the restoreths. Those aren't words we use in regular conversation, so when we hear it, it, it touches us. But I also believe that the resonating power of the 23rd Psalm comes not simply from its beautiful language, but two words that are in it, though and through. You know, they're actually the same word except for the letter R in the English. But it's that one little letter that makes all the difference in the world. But you see, David, the shepherd boy who we think composed this, maybe when he was out in the woods and taking care of the sheep, he, he knew the truth behind that word, though. He knew it because he knew there was danger lurking at every corner. There were lions and tigers and bears, oh my, in the mountains where he tended and watched his father's sheep. And he knew there was no if, but the reality of life was that it was filled with obstacles and problems. I think part of the beauty of this psalm is that it candidly faces the inevitable. For it proclaims not if, but though. Though I walk through the valley. The valley of shadows, the valley of the shadow of death. When I was studying this week, I came to realize, you know there's actually a valley of the shadow of death in the Holy Land? It is. I think we have a picture of it, if we can throw it up on the screens for you. Can we get it there? Do we have the slide? Oh, come on. We got it there, Johnsley. I think it should be in there as the next slide. There we go. See, it's, it's, it's a valley. 
It's a valley that cuts through the mountains. It's called the Wadi Quelt, and it's just south of the Jericho Road, and it, it leads from Jerusalem down to the Dead Sea. And it's a narrow canyon through the mountain range, and, and the shepherds knew about it because due to climatic conditions and overgrazing and things like that, they would have to move their sheep through this valley to move them from one grassland to another grassland for feeding. And travel through this valley was tremendously dangerous. It was dangerous because its floor was badly eroded from the runoff from the cloud burst when the rains came and the seasonal flooding. The actual footing was, was solid rock, but it would get so narrow in places that, that a sheep couldn't, couldn't turn around as they would try to go through there. And there's also a spot where there's this big gap, an eight-foot gully, and there's a, a difference of about 18 inches between one side and the other. And the sheep would have to come through there and jump to get to the other side. And so the shepherd would stand down there in the gap and try to help his sheep get through there and encourage them and prod them to do it. And if, if one fall, he'd take his crook and he'd kind of pull them back up from down there. And the other thing is, this valley was filled with wild dogs, and so he always had to be watching. And if a, if a lead sheep that was leading the way with the shepherd following them would come across one of those dogs, it would start bawling and bleeding and making noise as a warning. And then the shepherd would throw that rod to knock down the dog and into the washed-out gully where it could be easily killed. And because they had the shepherd with them, the sheep would go into this valley, even though it was filled with so many challenges, without any fear, because they knew that their master, their shepherd, was going to be there to protect them. I think the same is true for us. I'm sure we've learned over time, life isn't always loaded tables and overflowing cups and green pastures. Sometimes our hair isn't anointed, but rather it's smeared with grease. And sometimes we're, we're not lying in green pastures, we're flailing in blue Mondays. And sometimes we're not resting by the shore of still waters, but we're struggling in valleys that make this look like a piece of cake. And it's because every one of us has valleys. Some of us have a valley maybe that was given us at birth, a valley of poverty or perhaps an abusive family, a disability. Some of us, though we were born into to green pastures of plenty, immediately proceed to dig our own valleys of the shadow, falling into the trap of drugs and alcohol and other things, violence, ignorance, prejudice. Some of us encounter valleys when we wrestle with illness and loss, the pain and struggles of a loved one facing tough diagnoses and those illnesses that are all around us. Yet the thing is, while we're walking these valleys, these deep ruts, the Bible teaches us that God is with us. And our God who is with us is able to bear all those sufferings in the world that we encounter, those hurts of our scarred and scared souls. For though none of us gets out of life without walking the valley, the psalmist tells us it's plain that God does not intend for us to sojourn in the valley forever. For the valley of the shadow is something one goes through. Valleys aren't resting places. Valleys are passageways. And we can walk through them. We can walk through our problems. We can walk through our sorrows. We can walk through our pain. We can even walk through our screw-ups. And, and we can do this because as this wonderful psalm promises that in all these journeys, the Lord will walk through with us. Texas mogul Bob Buford wrote a book called The Second Half. And in it, he tells a really sad story. It's the story of when his investment banker son Ross drowned in the Rio Grande River. His son disappeared and they sent in 41 trackers to try to find him. Buford himself, having lots of money, he hired airplanes, helicopters, boats, tracker dogs, everything that money could buy. 
And he even went down there and he joined in the search himself. And he walked along a limestone bluff about 200 feet above the river. And he said he was frightened as he ever felt in his life. And he says as he was walking there, he began to say to himself, here's something I can't dream my way out of. Here's something... I can't think your way out of. Here's something you can't buy your way out of. Here's something you can't work your way out of. This, he said, is something you can only trust your way out of. Something you can only trust your way out of. I believe the psalmist understood this truth. That though trials comes and the valleys of life are deep and dark and we face things that our finite resources cannot overcome, we must trust in order to get through them. We have to trust in the promises of God. We have to trust the one who loves us as a good shepherd loves his sheep. We, we have to trust the one who walks with us, ever supporting and strengthening us. And we need to trust that one who will even carry us when we can't do it on our own. Because I believe that that is actually what the psalmist means when he says, dwelling in the house of the Lord forever at the end of this psalm. But you see, to dwell in the house of the Lord is to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. Wrapped in those arms of the good shepherd no matter what we are, where we are, or what we are facing. Henry Nowens, one of my favorite, favorite Catholic writers, he's been gone several years now. But he wrote about how he felt that many people live as if we've forgotten our address. And that we're in the wrong place, living in the house of fear instead of the house of the Lord. In scriptures, when we read them, it it seems that God's people do this over and over and over again. We forget, or we get confused, and we're reluctant to move out of the house of fear into the house of the Lord. It's kind of like we want to kind of keep one foot in each for some reason, because we're afraid of letting go, and not quite faithful enough to let ourselves be scooped up And that love, that love that's that's literally waiting to bring us home. Sometimes we live in that house of fear without even realizing it. We're anxious, we're, we're nervous. We're afraid of economic decline and worry about the costs of our children's education and health care and our retirements. Sometimes we get afraid of the world, the foreigners, those people who are different from us. Sometimes we're afraid of disease, COVID, cancer. We're afraid of what we know. We're we're afraid of what we don't know. We're afraid of change, but we're afraid of standing still. And so fear begins to shape all of our decisions and our choices. But as now one reminds us, the, the alternative to this house of fear It's this thing called the house of love. And in Nowen's words, it's the place where we can think, speak, and act in the ways of God and not in the ways of a fear-filled world. And Jesus, our good shepherd, offers us this house even now in the midst of our anxieties and our fears. In John 15, 4, he says, Make your home in me, and I will make my home in you. And it is Jesus making his home in us and with us that enables us to live with hope, to live with strength even as we walk through the valleys of this life. It's it's God's love in Christ Jesus which turns our those into throughs. For as I mentioned, though and through only differ by one little letter, the letter R. I should have asked Tommy this, but I think the sign language symbol for that's a cross fingers is the symbol for the letter R. I know we often use cross fingers for something else, hoping things will go okay. But the thing is, fingers crossed like this didn't start with American Sign Language. And it didn't start with little kids crossing their fingers and hoping to, to die, those things when we make those crazy promises. It's Christians. Christians invented this symbol of crossed fingers. 
And it had nothing to do with luck. But it had everything to do with trusting God. You see, in the early years of the church, it was illegal to be a Christian. And Christians were vigorously persecuted, and, but the believers found ways to communicate their faith in subtle ways. And so whenever they would accompany someone, when they, they would see them and they would greet them, they'd do this. And they would know that they were Christians too, that they were people of the cross. And the cross fingers became a symbol of that cross and the redemption and the hope Christ's death and resurrection brought to all people. And I believe that's what these cross fingers of the R mean. It's that we're a people who trust in God. Trust that though the world will throw all kinds of things at us, but because of that cross, we can get through. And those valleys are just passageways through which we're traveling on to the other side where we can live into those promises that God has for us. So my prayer this week, as you go through your week and we encounter those bumps in the road, we encounter those things that challenges us, that when you encounter them, you might think of that R and, and cross your fingers not in some kind of a way of wishing or hoping, but simply as a way of remembering. Remembering that we're Christians and that God is with us. And no matter what we face, we can get through it because he walks with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Okay, David. As we bring our time of worship together, we're going to close by singing number 3040 in worship and song, You Are My All in All. So let's stand and sing together.
Now let us go forth into this world that though it may be filled with valleys, we know we can get through them because of the one that walks with us. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.